All right, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the, the nice day, for the opportunity to uh, open thy word and to consider what we, we're going to see out of it. Thank thee, Father, for all the time we've been able to spend in it, especially in the book of Revelation. Pray that thou would uh, be with us as we open it and, and, and bring it to a close today. Um, uh, ask, Father, that thou would open our eyes when we behold wondrous things out of it. We ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So uh, we're at Revelation 22 for the, for the benefit of anybody that might be watching this online. This is the last, the last of Revelation, and we've been doing this for about a year and three months. And so uh, we're going to take a break. <laughs> um, so uh, Lord willing, we may or may not, probably won't, uh, record what we're going to do starting in September. We'll probably not record it. Um, but uh, anybody that's a subscriber, if we do put something online, you'll, my understanding is you get it. I'm not a, I'm not a YouTube uh, expert, but my understanding is if you're a subscriber, you get a, a, a notification when something like that happens. So we're at Revelation 22, 16. I'm calling this the, uh, the final invitation and warnings because that's kind of what the last uh, few verses uh, is all about. In, um, I guess I'll go ahead and read it. There's only a few verses here, and then, then I'll, uh, I'll make some comments as we go. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let, let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. As I mentioned last week, this portion, it's sometimes a little difficult to uh, really comprehend who's speaking at the time. Um, it's obvious from verse 16, I, Jesus, right? So it's obviously Jesus is speaking in that case. And, and he tells um, us that he sent his angel to testify. And so therefore, the angel was Jesus' representation, representative, I should say, representative, to bring the message to us through John's writings. As believers, I'm going to apply that to us, we are Christ's representative, uh, collectively representatives to the world. I gave you uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, and it says, uh, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So we are reconciled to, 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 to God uh, by Jesus Christ, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto him. And here's a, a key and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So when we speak to somebody about the Lord and they get saved, they can be reconciled. So we, we are committed the word of reconciliation. Verse 20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. For though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. So how are we doing as, as Christ's ambassadors? Uh, are we living uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2? Next uh, passage on the first page of your handout. We should be. Um, God through Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God says it's not unreasonable to do that. It's your reasonable service. And then it uses two formed words. Be not conformed to this world, but in contrast to being conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So that's what we ought to be doing, is, uh, is being transformed by the renewing of our mind, um, and, and, and that allows us to be better ambassadors. We have uh, more handouts back there if you'd uh, like to give them, give one. Welcome. <clears throat> In um, the next part of uh, Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the root and the offspring of David. Now, we'll get to the bright and morning star in a second. He said he's the root and the offspring of David. We've looked at these next verses a couple of times before, but not necessarily uh, looking at this specifically. In Psalm 110, 1, um, we see two persons of the Godhead uh, where it said, the Lord, all caps, said unto my Lord, only the L is capitalized. Sit thou, this is what he said, sit thou on my, at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So the Lord, I, we talked about this before in the King James Bible, when uh, Lord or God is capitalized, all caps, uh, that's Jehovah. When only the capital, when only the first, the L is capitalized, that's Adonai. So in this case, what it's saying is the God the Father is speaking God to the Son. We're going to see that in Matthew 22 in just a second. To, that sit thou at my right hand. It's going to become obvious as we read uh, Matthew 22, because the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to the Pharisees is going to refer to this verse. Matthew 22, 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Now, the Lord Jesus Christ never asked a question that he, one, didn't know the answer to, and he asked everything he said was for a purpose. And so he said, he asked the Pharisees, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They said unto him, The son of David. Well, he was right. They were right, I should say. He saith unto him, unto them, he saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, and then he quotes verse, uh, Psalm 110.1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man uh, from that day forth ask him any more questions. Well, the answer is really simple, but then we have the Holy Spirit today. Uh, people that do not have the Holy Spirit may not get it. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. He was God back when, well, <laughs> in eternity. He was always God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the second person of the God had called the Word in uh, seven places in, in uh, John's writings. <clears throat> And so from that perspective, he is David's Lord. The Lord said unto my Lord. So how is he David's, uh, how is David his, uh, how is, how is, hello, how is Jesus David's, uh, I'm, I'm getting all mixed up. He's the root, I'm going to just read my notes. He's the root because he is, of, he, he is David's Lord. So the, the root and the offspring of David. And he's the offspring of David because Jesus, the man, came in David's line. Okay. Through, the, uh, through uh, Mary the virgin. <clears throat> this thing's going to be in my way. <clears throat> and then we get to uh, the last part of uh, Revelation twenty two sixteen, where it says, I am the... The, uh, and the bright, he said, I am earlier, and the, the, he says, and the bright and the morning star, the bright and morning star. 
Uh, the church age believer, and in, in, uh, so we're at Revelation 2.28, uh, bottom of the first page of your handout. Again, Revelation 2 and 3 are the, where uh, God, through Jesus Christ, speaks to the seven churches that were existed at that time, but they also represented the church age. And each of those seven churches, they were, something was promised to the overcomers. The overcomers were the believers. So this was something that was promised to the believers, in this case, in uh, chapter 2, verse 28, and to the overcomer. And, uh, and, and what it says is, I will give him the morning star. Well, in Revelation 22, uh, 16, he said, I am the, uh, the, I am the bright and morning star. So Jesus Christ is then tied to the church because he is the morning star and we were promised that we were going to uh, get him. The, 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 the New Testament believers want to get the, uh, the morning star. Now, I didn't, I, didn't, um, I, I didn't do the research to... I'm getting a little warm. Uh, the research to, uh, <clears throat> to find out where this is. But in modern translations, they give uh, the devil credit to being the morning star. Well, he's not. <laughs> he's, he's as an angel of light, that's true. He's a lot of things because he imitates Christ, but, but he's not the morning star, unless you have a modern translation, in which case they, then he is. So uh, I would say bag the modern translation. Second page of your hand out at the top, I'll show you something else in a little, a little while, right out of an NIV. I'm going to quote an NIV later, isn't that something? <laughs> in a bad way, by the way, but anyway, the only reason I ever look at it. Um, Malachi 4, Malachi 4. Now, the context here is the tribulation and coming out of the tribulation. Uh, Malachi 4, 1, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, there's the tribulation, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, again, tribulation, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But, in contrast to them, but unto you that fear my name, shall the sun, look at, the, look at this, the capital S-U-N of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth as, and grow up as calves of the stall. That's, prom that's a promise of the Son of God, but here he's called the S-U-N, capital S-U-N, of righteousness. So that ties us back to the morning star. He's the Son of righteousness. That, by the way, is to the tribulation saints. We get to um, uh, Revelation twenty-two seventeen, and I think I mentioned this last week. Um, it, I'll read the whole verse, and then we'll I'll do some commenting then. Uh, Revelation twenty two seventeen, And notice the Spirit there in the first uh, third ver word there. The Spirit is uh, capitalized. That's the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Well, I believe that verse is twofold. One, it's asking uh, Christ to come back. And two, it's asking the lost to accept Christ as their Savior. Uh, we saw in verse uh, 7 of ch chapter 22, I'll, I'll read it for you. If you're there, you can read it with me, uh, where it said, Behold, I come quickly. In verse 12, we saw, And behold, I come quickly. Uh, in verse 16, um, he said, uh, the, uh, I have sent mine angel, I, I'm the bright morning star. And then, with that context, um, he says, the spirit and the bride say, come. So with the context of he's coming back, uh, uh, that's, we have to have this on our minds that we need to, uh, we're asking Jesus Christ to come back. And knowing that he's coming back, we need to, uh, 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 as best we can, whenever oppor the opportunity presents itself, we need to uh, witness to the lost so that they can uh, be one of those that say, come. Otherwise, they aren't coming. <laughs> um, the bride is the church. 
uh, and, and which is made up, the church is made up of all the individual believers uh, who should be looking for that blessed hope. I gave you uh, Titus 2, 13 and 14, um, second page of your handout near the top. And this is what we should be doing as believers, uh, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So he is the great God and our Savior who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify him to himself a peculiar people. That's the second time we've seen some place where we should be purified, zealous of good works. The next passage down, um, so now I'm looking at uh, about let him that is a thirst come. I'm looking at uh, John 4. Now this was during uh, Lord Jesus Christ's uh, earthly ministry. And uh, we actually looked at this here last week or week before. Um, and of course, this is the woman at the well. Uh, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldst have asked of him, and he, should, he would have given thee living water. Now, of course, we know in the context, um, he tells her that he is that one uh, that can, can do that. Um, and, then, and then she calls other men, other, the men and, and, and so forth. Verse 14, uh, But whosoever drinketh of water that I shall give him shall never thirst. So this is talking about a spiritual application of the water. But the water that... I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So I'm telling you that because Revelation 22 said, "Let him him as a thirst." They need that. Uh, they need that living water. In John 7, uh, 37, the Lord Jesus Christ again speaking. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, and I'm going to tie that to the next verse, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow uh, rivers of living water. So again, there's that living water that he's promised, but again, it's a spiritual application. It's not physical water. The next uh, passage is Psalm 36, 9. And in that one, the first part of the verse, I believe, applies to what we just read. Uh, Psalm 36, 9, for with thee is the fountain of life. So where's the, the water come from? Well, it comes from the fountain of life. And then it says, in thy light shall we see light. So I'm tying that part of the verse to 1 John 1, 7, where we saw before, and we're going to see it again when we read it, that, that 1 John 1, 7 is talking about light associated with fellowship. In thy light shall we see light. Uh, John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. So according to Psalm 36, 9, we have to be in thy light in order to see light. And according to 1 John 1, 7, if we're not in the light, we don't have fellowship. So we need fellowship to, uh, to, to, to see the light, and, to, and we have to be in the light in order to have the fellowship. It kind of ties it all together. In uh, Psalm 42, 1, Psalm 42, 1, a similar, similar type of a thing. As the heart, it's a, it's, it's a type of animal, type, I think it's in the deer family. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee. Um, well, these people back then were more, well, some, some now are, are more attuned to nature, but back then I think they were more attuned to nature. And they saw these things uh, on a daily basis uh, as the heart panteth after the water brooks. And as that is true, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. And then it says, my soul thirst thirstest, <laughs> Say that one easy. My th soul thirsteth 
for God, for the living God. Would to God that our soul thirsteth for him and for his word, and we don't just uh, uh, play church, uh, so to speak. Also, at the end of verse 17, it says, um, And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Well, that brings uh, salvation by grace through faith in there. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to do anything for it. All you have to do is believe. It's, it's free, the water of life freely. And, uh, and so the, the bride, the spirit and the bride is saying to the lost, um, uh, uh, come. And so when we say that to someone, we need to emphasize that salvation is by grace through faith. And one of the reasons we need to do that is there's so many denominations and religions out there that aren't saying that it's free. They aren't saying it's by grace through faith. It's they're saying you have to do something for your salvation. And some of them are, 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 are you know, outright with it. They, they just flat say, yeah, this is what you have to do. And others are a little more subtle. Well, remember, the one who was the subtle was the, the devil. The devil was subtle. Okay. So let's us not get grace and works confused. Salvation is by grace through faith. We see that in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and Titus 3, 5. Rewards are, are, are earned by, by works, two different things. And so once you're saved, you, uh, you, you can uh, earn rewards by doing works, but they're not the same thing. They're, not, they're, not, they're only related in that the saved person can now do works. And you can see that in Ephesians 2.10, Titus 3, 1, 8, and 14, if you want to write those down. Now we get to um, uh, an interesting portion of uh, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. I'll read the two, and then we'll look at a couple passages. Revelation 22, 18. Here's the warnings. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And I believe the book is primarily the book of Revelation, because that's where a lot of plagues happened. But I think it's the book in general, the, the God's, God's word. Verse 19, and if any man shall take away from the words of, this, of the book uh, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part, I'm going to talk about that in a second, out of the book of life and out of the holy city, in, from the things that are written in this book. So there's penalties for doing so. Um, if you add to it, God's going to, God's going to add unto him the plagues that are written in this book, according to verse 18. And if you take away, God's going to take away his part out of the book of life and the holy city and from the things written in this book. What well, turns out, there's at least three places in the Bible where God warns about taking away or, or adding to his word. Uh, this is the final one right here. But we also find it in a couple other places. Uh, near the bottom of your handout, Deuteronomy 4, that's, this is probably the first place that the warning is, is issued, the beginning, in the beginning. Um, Deuteronomy 4, 2, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye keep, may keep the commandments of the Lord, uh, the Lord your God, which I command you. So there's, there's in the beginning of the Bible, don't add to it and don't take away from it. In the middle, Proverbs th uh, chapter 30, verse 5 and 6, Every word of God is pure, he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Now, the next passage, Galatians, is not technically a warning about adding to his words. It's a warning about corrupting the, the gospel. But I included it because, um, uh, well, God included it, <laughs> right? It, 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 he's very strong in his language, as a matter of fact. In Galatians chapter 1, 
uh, speaking through Paul, God says, I marvel that you were, are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So right off the bat, we see that they're not all the gospels the same. Some people are teaching, preaching a different gospel. And then he says in verse 7, which is not another, but there some, be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So here the Galatian believers were hearing from people that had come in. They called them Judaizers. They were trying to make them be like uh, you know, Jews and, and make them Jews and say, basically, you need to keep the, uh, the, 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 the law and all those kinds of things. And so that's why I said, uh, there's, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So when, so when somebody adds to the gospel or takes away from the gospel, mainly adds to, that is perverting the gospel. And that's what most of the uh, earthly religions and denominations do. They're perverting the gospel of Christ. And then uh, God says uh, in verse 8, uh, But though we, or an angel from heaven, uh, preach any other gospel unto you that, uh, than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So somebody comes with the, the wrong gospel, you don't bring him into your house. When the Mormons show up at your door, you don't bring him into your house. When the Jehovah's Witnesses show up at your door, you don't bring him in your house. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. So if what you hear, uh, whether it be some uh, 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 other radio ministry or you visit somebody else's church or, or whatever, if they're preaching another gospel, they are accursed and you ought not be uh, spending time with them. Well, now, this, uh, this passage we were in, in Revelation uh, uh, 22, 18, and 19, um, that's the third place, the, the, the end of, of the Bible where, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this, this warning is. I didn't print this out, but I wanted to show you something in Psalm 12, 6, and 7. And I'm going to open my Bible to uh, Psalm 12, 6, and 7. And then I'm going to open this uh, Franklin device because it has King James and... NIV on it, uh, Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7, and I'm going to read the whole thing. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. Now, normally we quote 6 and 7 to prove that God has preserved his word, and he has, and there's no reason uh, not, not to see that. And it says, Psalm 12, 6, The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, the them is the words, uh, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. That Bible just told you that God was going to preserve his word. And I'm telling you, this is it. This is God's word preserved for for us in this day. He's preserved it in various uh, forms in the past. The NIV doesn't quite say that. I'll read the NIV 6 and 7, and then I'm going to read the rest of chapter 12 in the King James. The NIV says, and the, words, uh, and the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. You, Lord will keep the needy safe and will protect us forever from the wicked. Well, wait a second. It doesn't say anything about the words. It doesn't, the NIV doesn't, pre, doesn't preserve God's words. Well, I, I guess that's true because the NIV doesn't preserve God's words. So there you go. So the, the main scripture that we can turn to to prove that God <laughs> promised to preserve his word, NIV takes it out. I mean, he just, it just, and it says it's us. But wait a second, is it us? Well, let's read the rest of the chapter. Psalm 12, 1. Psalm 12, 1. I want to point out, uh, before we read it, that it's talking about what people say. Okay? Uh, Psalm 12, 1. 
Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. For the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak, I'm emphasizing the speak there, uh, vanity, every one with his neighbor, and with flattering lips, flattering lips, what do lips do? They speak, right? And with a double heart do they speak, right? And what do they speak? They speak words. The tongue, uh, the Lord shall cut off uh, all flattering lips. Now, this is King James. And the tongue that speaketh proud things, over and over and over, it's talking about people speaking words who have said, verse 4, with our tongue we will prevail, will we prevail? Our lips are our own, who is Lord over us. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Then it says, with all that in context of all the about speaking and all that, the words of the Lord. In contrast to what men speak, the words of the Lord are pure words. So, so when we get to verse 7 where it says, Thou shalt keep them, what's it talking about? It's talking about the words. It's clear that it's talking about the words, not the people. But if you've got an NIV, that's not the case. Back to Revelation 22, just in case this is the last thing anybody ever hears on the internet. <laughs> I want to make it clear that um, God preserved his word. And um, it said in uh, verse 19, Revelation 22, 19, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out, out of the holy city. Of course, the holy city we know is New Jerusalem from the previous couple chapters and from the things which are written in this, in, in this book. Well, I th it's, just, it's a little bit of a, different, a difficult portion because uh, believers can't lose their salvation. So what is his part? Well, I believe his part could be his rewards because we, we know, we, we read this last week as a matter of fact, that although you can't lose your salvation, you can lose your rewards uh, based on 1 Corinthians or is it 2 Corinthians? Anyway, it, it's, you, you can't. You, you can lose your rewards. Then we get to verse 20. He that testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. And, and, and it says, He that, testif he that testifieth these things well, it was verse six. In verse sixteen, it says, "I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches." In chapter one, verse one. So we're at uh, we're at um, third page of handout. Revelation one 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 one. <laughs> There's not three ones. One one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and again, shortly is not soon. It's, when it happens, it's, it's going to be quick. Uh, and he sent and signified it by his angel uh, unto his servant John. So God sent it through the angel to John to us, and he that testifies these things is coming through that angel and through John. So the angel speaks for Jesus just like an interpreter speaks for, for uh, the one they're interpreting for. And so when we speak uh, things of the Lord, it ought to be what the Lord says, not our own um, uh, thoughts or, or, or whatever. Now, we can explain it the best we, we, we know how, and there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, we ought to be using as much as we can be using the Lord's words. And what did this angel say? What did Jesus Christ say? We well, said, surely I come quickly. And again, we said, uh, saw that before. It, uh, it's going to be a while before he comes, but when he does, it'll be quickly. We know that from uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment and twinkling of an eye. So that's talking about the rapture. And uh, chapter 22, again, uh, behold, I come quickly. Uh, Blessed is he that uh, keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. That was verse 7, 22, 7. <clears throat> and again in verse, we saw these before. I'm just re reminding you, uh, Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. And uh, here, uh, surely I come quickly. We saw in Titus 2.13 that we're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God. And so when that happens, when he shows up, 
uh, that will be the fulfillment of that I come quickly. <clears throat> So John said, even so, come Lord Jesus. That's what he said in the um, verse uh, 20. Even so, come Lord Jesus. That was, the Lord, that was John speaking. John is a picture of the, of the church. Uh, John was the one who uh, laid on Jesus' breast at the, at the Last Supper. Uh, he's the one that, uh, that you know, said, Lord, who is it? When it figured, trying to figure out who it was that was going to betray him. And so he was, he's the one that Jesus loved, and, and, and it says that at the end of, book of John, uh, chapter, end of the book of John. In Revelation chapter 4, John is taken up into heaven, and we call that, that's the rapture. He's representing the church. So as, as such, he's, re, it's, he's, he's re representing the church, replying to the Lord. So it should be our foremost desire to Lord Jesus Christ for, to come back for us, to take us to the marriage of the Lamb and to the judgment seat of Christ, although I'm not sure everybody's looking forward to that, but it is what it is. It's, it's going to happen um, one way or the other. In uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 9, third page of your handout, second passage down, uh, until uh, Christ's return, this should be uh, Christ. Uh, we should follow uh, Paul's, uh, uh, what Paul did. I'm, I'm losing it on, on wording today. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Uh, and this is uh, after Paul had asked the Lord to, to heal him of this, uh, of this uh, infirmity that he had. The Lord replied with, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. We're talking about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ here in the last, uh, the last verse of, of, of the Bible. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, be with you all. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. <laughs> These are some hard words. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I didn't have a good appreciation <laughs> for that before, but um, that's, things have changed a little bit. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure <laughs> in infirmities. Would do it were so. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities in persecutions in distresses for Christ's sake. Make sure it's for Christ's sake. Now, you, know, you, you don't go out there and make a fool of yourself and, and do things you ought not do and then say, I, you know, I'm, I'm in jail for Jesus when in fact you're in jail for being an idiot. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> it happens. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I, I am strong. And the implication is when you're strong, you're not where you need to be as far as uh, dealing with the Lord, but, uh, for the Lord. But when you're weak, you're strong. <clears throat> Again, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Uh, amen. In Titus 2.11, I'm going to look at a couple of passages together that, and it's not st strictly about Revelation, but I think it gives us a little bit of an indication of what the grace of God is. So I'm, I'm going to compare Titus 2.11 and Titus 3.4, two passages on the third page of your handout. And I'm, I'm going to think of it in a, in a mathematical way. We've got two verses here that have two phrases in each of the verses. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Titus 3, 4 says, but after the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. So the toward man appeared is very similar 
2 hath appeared to all men in, in, in chapter 2, verse 11. So I'm saying, if those two are the same, and I think they are, it hath appeared to all men and toward man appeared, if they're the same, that means that the grace of God has some relationship to the kindness of, and love of God. So sometimes it's hard to um, define what uh, the grace of God is. Well, I think that helps us. Is that the, the, the final definition, the whole definition? Probably not. Probably not. But I think it helps us. The kindness and love of God, the grace of God. The last passage in your handout in uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So, uh, was he, is he rich? Well, he was, he's God that owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? He made the whole world. The whole thing belongs to him. He's rich. But when he took on human flesh, when Jesus, when, when, when God the Son, the eternal Son, we called the Word, capital W-R-D, became flesh, became, took on, uh, became a baby uh, called Jesus through the Virgin Mary, he became poor. And it says right here that though he's rich, yet for your sakes, for our sakes, he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Well, how is that? Well, through his poverty, he died on a cross. He lived, he lived a, 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 a life that was, was not uh, the life of a king, even though he was a king. He didn't take a, his kingship when he was here the first time. Is he a king? And uh, He's king over the kingdom of God, but he's not a king over the kingdom of heaven yet. And that's going to happen in the future. That happens at the end of the tribulation. So we can be rich, uh, but mainly we can be rich spiritually. Uh, New Testament believers, church age believers, were never promised earthly blessings. That's what the, the Jews the, uh, uh, were, were promised. They were uh, promised earthly blessings. The, the seed of Abraham was, was, defined, was shown in two different ways. They had a heavenly seed, which would be uh, uh, us, and he, uh, it was spiritual, and he had an earthly seed, which we, would be the Jews. And you can see that in Romans also, that we're, we're the spiritual seed of Abraham. So we don't, we don't get to, like the Charismatics try to make it out to be, we don't get to claim Israel's blessings and by the way, they don't want the curses. They only want the blessings. Um, uh, and we don't get those. Will God bless us with earthly blessings? He might. He might. But he didn't promise us that. So we just got to keep that in mind and not, you know, oh, well, God's got a bigger shovel than I do. Therefore, if I, you know, give him more, he'll give me more and all that nonsense. That's, <laughs> you know, that's, 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 what he, that's what's taught out there. So. That ends, that ends the book of Revelation. I've, I've enjoyed it. Um, again, for anybody that maybe didn't hear it at the beginning, we're, we're not going to be doing any, uh, any recording, any, any messages until the second week in September. 9-11, as it turns out, Lord willing. Or maybe we'll be in heaven. And that'll be okay. I can't hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, something you might consider. Um, we heard this uh, years ago. Thank you for the adulation, by the way. Praise God for that. If, if you were to be put on trial for being a Christian, whether there'd be enough evidence to convict you, that's, that's good. good, good thought. Um, uh, would be that, that it were so. Let's close in a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll see if we can maybe see, have some questions and answers. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this um, time together. Thank Thee, Father, for the opportunity to open Thy Word. Pray that Thou would be with us as we have further fellowship. Pray that Thou would use the rest of the day to Thy glory, and we ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.